Dark Souls, an experience that molded masochists, that beat us up more than that coin-operated massage chair at the local shopping mall, that put hair on our chests while simultaneously molding the hair on our heads, the game that ruined other games? Well, there's a lot of hot takes and opinions out there with gaming as a whole, but a popular one that I can relate to is the prospect of did Dark Souls ruin gaming? Since we are so far past the point where Dark Souls shook up the gaming genre landscape, this will end up being more of a retrospective that includes current information as well. Did you feel like when you finally accomplished beating your first Souls title that going back to the games you liked before was not nearly as fun? I don't mean that the idea of the game seemed boring, but the actual gameplay and progression didn't quench that brand new thirst fit for an elephant. I definitely had this exact experience. In fact, when other people told me that they did too, I felt a lot more normal because I had never had this happen playing video games, and I was low-key worried that I had maxed out some hidden stat in real life and I could never go back. The best comparison I can make to this feeling is when you discover something about yourself in a situation, or even the world and how you relate to certain things, and you can no longer filter information from the perspective you had previously. Though Miyazaki made a world that became increasingly special the deeper you dove in, I still think there's more things at play here, but at the end of the day, Dark Souls is not some transcendental experience. The one thing though is that it did have things that we didn't see much of in the mainstream. I happen to be very interested in the subject of meta-learning and what makes things tick. I've even talked about my hypothesis on this entire subject many times back when I would stream challenging speedruns. First, let's take a look at what's happening in your brain when we play a game. I'm going to take a second to go over the National Library of Medicine's biotechnical information on gaming in abstract form. Video gaming as a popular form of leisure activity and its effect on cognition, brain function, and structure has come into focus in the field of neuroscience. Visuospatial cognition and attention seem to benefit the most, whereas for executive functions, memory and general cognition, the results are contradictory. The particular characteristics of video games driving these effects remain poorly understood, namely the lack of precise definitions of video gaming, the lack of distinct choice of cognitive ability under study, and the lack of standardized study protocols. Less research exists on neural changes in addition to cognitive changes due to video gaming. Existing studies reveal the evidence for the involvement of similar brain regions in functional and structural changes. There seems to be a predominance in the hippocampal, prefrontal, and parietal brain regions. However, studies differ immensely, which makes a meta-analytic interpretation vulnerable. We conclude that theoretical work is urgently needed. Now I'd like to dive into a more in-depth perspective of how we see dopamine. Dopamine is closely connected to the reward center of our brains. So whenever we see a reward worth chasing, our body starts producing sufficient amounts of dopamine to motivate us to do the task no matter how strenuous or difficult the task might be. Now with games, you could see how the entertainment aspect of it can get pretty skewed with the fact that it's a motivator, because being motivated to do something that might not have a high return on investment could be a perceived downside. But that doesn't mean that the dopamine is going to be the same for every single experience, including what we're talking about in this video. Since we become incentivized or pushed in the direction of that reward, we keep triggering it over and over again, and that establishes a baseline enjoyment of the activity. Though sometimes controversial, lots of information exists on how there's pros and cons of playing games overall for the brain. Pattern recognition, reaction time, and problem solving are skills that I've noticed increase. But on the flip side, it's very likely that excess amounts of cheap dopamine are being dumped into the brain. And that's pretty common in a game that would give you a large sense of gratification at every single corner. After a while, I'm sure we can all admit the luster of that reward wears off so much that some people even play games they no longer like. Meanwhile, they're trash-talking someone's mom on League of Legends, probably well in bronze rank as well. What exactly is different about Dark Souls that makes dopamine greater or occur more often? I'd argue that it actually occurs much less frequently. Why exactly? Well, think of a mainstream AAA game in the first place. Long story short, you are the action hero, the main character that dictates all. You have the guidance of the game maker in excess and most likely difficulty settings that severely decrease the blow to your ego when you find the sweet spot for your skill level. In Dark Souls, what do we have? There are definitely tools to succeed, but at the cost that requires a lot more willpower and innovation to overcome obstacles meant to offer a much more classic arcadey challenge. That challenge embodies what gaming used to be, but luckily we are now in a renaissance that's changing with Souls-like titles and unforgiving games that transpired after Dark Souls. 
So we know that the struggle of the journey is much greater on average, and that the runtime and content rivals most games. To sum it all up, these reasons lead me to think that the dopamine hits are similar to that of a disciplined activity, but also with the downside of that it's still a game, so it's not going to be a perfect scenario, but hopefully you can see where I'm going with this. Don't fool yourself and think Dark Souls completion gives you ultimate superpowers, or will allow you to automatically dominate any kind of subject, but I've seen so many positive benefits despite this video's subject entailing that it takes away joy from other things. Once someone experiences delayed gratification, while also loving the game at the same time, it builds this capacity to handle more challenge, and maybe even seek that challenge at a greater level. Well, if you fast forward from 2011 until now, that's a similar story I can relate to. I played these games, and I definitely want to be challenged more often in gaming than ever. Some people in my community have told me that the mindset of not giving up on the game made them more resilient in real life as well. Now that's a worthwhile trade-off, even if it did ruin other games in the process. I mentioned this in an older video, that Mega Man Extreme was the true gateway to the world of masochism at the ripe age of seven. It's actually hilarious because I went back to Mega Man Extreme on the Game Boy Color and I couldn't believe how hard it was in the context of being one of the first games I ever actually owned. After completing Dark Souls in ways that most wouldn't think of doing, the benefits from that mindset most definitely more than doubled my skill immediately after returning to certain genres like fighting games and action platformers that are a bit more tricky, specifically indie titles as well. Sure, you could say that I could have just practiced anything hard and gained this, but let's take a second to commend game developers for standing by their vision and not compromising it to make people feel better. More people feeling better or more comfortable does not inspire courage and determination. But it is important to state here that entertainment is a business and ultimately they have to have some level of satisfaction and joy for people to purchase the product, so there's got to be a little bit of a balance. There's nothing wrong with leisurely playing video games, or even using it as escapism, since a big part of entertainment in general is to free the mind and decompress at a lot of corners. I think fantasy books versus self-improvement books would be a good argument here. A valuable part of improvement might be taking a break and relaxing as well, so even in the fantasy or escape there can be improvement. I prefer goal setting in games and technical skill for improvement. Some noteworthy games that drastically improved from my experience with Dark Souls were the Street Fighter series, Mortal Kombat, Super Smash Brothers on a bit more of a technical level than just the party game, Super Mario, especially the ROM hack or I guess you could say Mario Maker levels that require extra types of strategies that are not just regular mechanics. And on top of that, we also have Metroid, Mega Man like I mentioned before, and I even beat Mike Tyson's Punch-Out randomly one afternoon on someone else's Nintendo when I first tried it. There's several other games that were more impacted from the speedrunning and the challenges on Souls, but nonetheless. In summary, Dark Souls did ruin other games, but it opened a world for improving one's patience and resilience resulting in potential successes elsewhere. I would absolutely love your input on what Dark Souls did to your reality of gaming after your first completion, or even if there's another game that's not related to Dark Souls but also challenged you a lot and made you uncomfortable for a very long time, what did it do and maybe what did it make you change in how you enjoy other things. As always, shout out to Miyazaki for making a great experience. I have something else cool to share with you guys before we're done. Recently I made a music channel showcasing my journey of becoming a solid drummer and also featuring my longtime guitar playing. I may also attempt singing if it's requested, and the genres are unlimited. Other than pop country of course because... You know what actually no no I'll, I'll yeah I'll do pop country just if this video reaches 10,000 likes. Make sure to check out the link to Squillatoons in the pinned comment and be one of the first subscribers. Well, at the time of this video being filmed, actually there's quite a few, so maybe you'll be one of the first hundred, but... If there's a subject you want me to cover in the future video, chances are I will if you comment it and it's a good one. I'll go back to old videos and occasionally get inspired by your experiences and questions. But for now, be well and I'll see you in the next one.